Foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hello and welcome back to Durian ASEAN. Yo, it's Gauri today, and it's a beautiful uh, Thursday morning. And uh, of course, I'm here to bring you news from all over Southeast Asia and as well as some other important headlines as well. But before we move on with our news commentary for this morning, I would just like to uh, share with you a little uh, quote or a wise saying from Mahatma Gandhi who said that keep your thoughts positive because your thoughts become your words and keep your words positive because your words become your behavior. Keep your behavior positive because your behavior becomes your habit. And keep your habits positive because your habits become your values. And keep your values positive because your values become your destiny. And uh, it's a very deep uh, quote by Mahatma Gandhi there who stresses a lot on positive thinking because uh, change of mindset is actually one of the key uh, area that you need to work on that can definitely transform your life. And uh, when you think positive, you attract positive energy in your life and more positive things will be happening to you. So remember that. Stay positive no matter what happens. And uh, let's move on to uh, India for a moment where we have a little funny story. India's police seek cows' mugshots to enforce their beef ban. So in order to enforce their beef ban, what they're doing is they are getting all the farmers to send in photographs of all their animals, especially the cows, so they can keep track of which cows that have been slaughtered and which cows have not been. And this is a pretty uh, tough new ban on uh, beef on the slaughter of cows. And actually nearly 100 farmers and other owners in uh, Malaygaon uh, have so far complied with the request for all these uh, mugshots uh, according to the superintendent of the city. And after the new law, commercial slaughter will be uh, stopped, uh, especially on a larger scale. But this program will still help uh, help them all to stop killing by also helping to trace any animal thefts even faster. So it's not just about uh, animal slaughter here that they want the muck shots. It also helps the uh, farmers themselves to keep track of their cattle and to see if uh, any of them get stolen. And the Home Minister uh, Rajnath Singh also told the spiritual leaders on the weekend that their Hindu nationalist government would try its level best to introduce a nationwide ban uh, through this consensus. And a little, uh, that's a very entertaining uh, news to kick off the morning here. Uh, and let's move on to what's happening in Malaysia, in our very own backyard. Of course, we uh, heard about the news where a couple of journalists from uh, the Malaysian Insider got arrested. And uh, they have been released without a remand, according to their lawyer, Sharitzan Johan. But however, this whole news is much more than just about the journalists getting arrested. It's more about the freedom of expression, the freedom of speech, the freedom of press. And uh, in, in accordance to that, a journalist are uh, supposedly wearing black today uh, all over the country in support of the arrested newsmen. And journalists, even in newsrooms, at press conferences, uh, yesterday, everyone was uh, dressed in black, and uh, today it continues. Uh, everyone who wants to show their solidarity are uh, dressed in black all over KL, especially. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, in solidarity with the five editors and top ex- executives of the Malaysian Insider who were arrested under the Sedition Act. And the Institute of Journalists Malaysia said that, of course, wearing black is not just a sign of solidarity, but it's also a sign of protest. Uh, against the attack on press freedom as a whole because when uh, the whole freedom of press uh, gets oppressed, it's very hard for the media to tell the truth to the people, which is what they want to uh, do ultimately. And 
this is of course also comes under the Sedition Act and uh, according to them they have to voice out we all actually have to voice out uh, that freedom of speech has to be a priority not only for the journalists in the country but pretty much for everyone every citizen in Malaysia is guaranteed their freedom of speech and therefore uh, just because of certain articles or certain speeches made uh, things get taken out of context and it leads to a lot of people getting arrested under the Sedition Act. And uh, the freedom to tell the truth is another tricky thing because there's always uh, a fine line there between telling the truth and also uh, just saying whatever you want and possibly inciting uh, hate or in, uh, inciting violence. But these are very subjective things because one thing, when someone says something, it could be hurtful to me, but it wouldn't be hurtful to the next person. So it, I guess it also goes back to the majority of uh, people in Malaysia uh, who exactly gets offended by a certain article or a certain speech made as opposed uh, to the other uh, side of the party. And in this field itself, uh, also according to the Institute of Journalists Malaysia, they said in the field itself, yes, of course, we are competitors, but at the end of the day, we are all friends in this industry and we should stay that way. And another country that is also giving their media a hard time is Thailand, just uh, uh, above us, uh, towards the north. And it seems Thailand is uh, suspending their TV for violation. And uh, two Thai, Thai television channels affiliated to the opposition, which is the Red Shirt Movement, will be taken off air for seven days for violating their junta orders. And this is the latest strike against the freedom of expression in the military-ruled kingdom. And uh, we all know that uh, Thailand actually has very, very, uh, a very polarized political uh, channels where they are very extreme. You're either... Uh, towards the left or you're either towards the right and you hardly find someone who is neutral, someone in, in the middle ground and uh, because of this it makes it uh, kind of even easier for, for the government to keep track of the television channels that are pro-opposition and easily shut them down whenever they feel like it and the country's uh, Pro polarized political channels are also the first casualty of censorship that came about uh, following the declaration of the martial law and the coup that happened last May. And the ban on them can be lifted on the condition that they stay clear off politics. And it's very hard to tell a TV channel to stay off politics because that is where a majority of the people uh, turn to for all their information about what the government is doing, what the opposition is doing, or what's new in the political scene, uh, who's up to what. Uh, but it seems that in Thailand that may not really be the case. And the suspension letters are also being drafted for Peace TV, which is another TV. And this one features a daily program by the Red Shirts chairman himself, uh, Jatupon Prompan, and also 24 News, according to the official at the Thai uh, Broadcasting Authority. And uh, this goes back to also what's happening in Malaysia at the moment. Of course, we don't have any TV channels getting banned, but uh, we've been receiving a lot of uh, sort of feedback from the government on what's uh on, on our coverage on the local media, especially those alternative medias that are reporting news that the mainstream media do not report because ultimately people want to know what's really happening. They want they don't want a distorted uh, version of reality. They don't want some sugar-coated news that uh, people want you to believe. What they really want is to know what's going on in the country. Uh, what are the problems that we're facing? How much death are we having? And uh, it's the truth that is the most important to the people because that is how you, uh, at the end of the day, uh, build your trust towards uh, the ruling government, uh, the, the ruling party in your country. And the, the freedom to express yourself when you are dissatisfied about something or simply just giving your opinion uh, out in public. Uh, it can be in the form of a YouTube video. It can be writing an article, uh, sending it to uh, a newspaper. Uh, it's very important that we protect these uh, fundamental rights that we have as a citizen uh, to be able to voice out our opinion. And if someone is dissatisfied, instead of attacking you uh 
and threatening to, to close down your company or arresting you, what should be done is that we need to start uh, getting to that mentality where we need to sit down and talk to someone if we're not happy about what they have said and come up with, with, with an argument, with a rebuttal and argue it out with them on, on why you think that they should not have said that or should not have that opinion. And we have a few more news about Thailand uh, before we continue. Gonna take a short break and uh, see you in a bit. ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. And of course, yeah, with us on our ASEAN Daily. So. Uh, we we seldom hear about Thailand nowadays, but actually, uh, there's some development, positive development on Thai's uh, junta uh, regime. Apparently, they lifted the martial law, but unfortunately, absolute power still <laughs> remain. <laughs> so that's not a very good news, is it? Well, it's half half good news, I think. <laughs> Probably. So it seems that they lifted uh, the martial law, but uh, somehow General uh, Prayut Chanocha or uh, He's in charge of Thailand now and he still has absolute power and can uh, call most of the shots. So that doesn't really uh, propel Thailand towards democracy like what they were planning to they earlier. They are still remaining in control. Yeah, is, um, in, in other words, they are still having that absolute power over uh, the Thai citizen. And uh, although it's not uh, probably very visible in everyday life, there are actually a few soldiers in the streets all the time. And this has, uh, according to the news, scared off foreign investors and terribly hurt the tourism in the country. And that's bad because tourism actually accounts for 10% of Thailand's GDP. But they don't have like a number to compare between mm -hmm. uh pre-junta uh, tourist populations and post-junta uh, population of tourism uh, of tourists, sorry but but at the same time, you know um, I still remember when uh, Myanmar was still a close country when mm -hmm. you see military uh, posts in every uh, roads, uh, road corner but you actually feel very safe it's just that perception of it and in fact, uh, crime has was at very low level. So I, I guess it's a kind of give and take. Like mm -hmm. you have a lot of military police on the street. People feel much more safer, but then there's no freedom for people to express themselves. And for tourists, uh, they might feel uh, a bit more scared because it might somehow create this sense that they are being monitored. And uh, I think you're right, it's more of a perception thing. Where usually when we think about Thailand, we are used to uh, the whole impression about Thailand being this, this beautiful country with beaches and, and the sky bar and, and how it's just pretty much open to anybody to and go the there tourism. and have fun. Exactly. <laughs> so when they start having uh, police or soldiers everywhere, uh, I guess that changes the whole uh landscape of, of Thailand itself on how people view it, especially when it comes to the foreign investors when uh, they they come in and see this whole change that's happening in Thailand and don't, they don't feel too comfortable anymore to actually uh, start investing in Thailand itself. According to Thai's uh, king, he actually made uh, the official approve of a request from the Junta Martial Law to be lifted. In fact, the palace issued a statement saying that it was no longer necessary. So the Thai king is heavily involved in trying to transit Thailand towards, I would say, quote-unquote democracy. Mm -hmm. And it seems he also has a very uh, close relationship with uh, Prayut Chanocha, uh, who also worked together uh, with him to lift the martial law. Uh, but he is going to replace it with a new uh, thing called the cons uh, sorry the Article Forty Four that will be taking place uh, of the martial law. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I mean, it reminds me of uh, what we ha what is happening right now in mm -hmm. Malaysia when you abolish the ISA, but you then replace it with mm -hmm. another law that is. Somehow similar to the ISA, but not quite so. 
So I, I'm not sure how Article 44 will affect the Thai societies. Uh, we, maybe experts can share their view on this. But uh, for sure, absolute power is still remain uh, a reality in Thailand right now. And it seems that with the removal of this martial law, or I would say rather the replacement with the Article 44 from uh, the outside, it seems like uh, it's good for business, it's good for tourism because they're trying to have like a revamp. But it seems from the inside, if you're still in Thailand, it's pretty much still the same. Uh, there are still all the restrictions in place and uh, the political uh, expression, it's uh, still pretty much draconian and you, it's still very restricted in Thailand. Mm-hmm. doesn't really... Uh, give much of a difference to the people there. On a similar news uh, regarding on Article 44, uh, human rights groups are actually co- very concerned in the future of Thailand's democracy. And I think it's not just uh, in terms of the replacement for Article 44, it's also the fact that uh, the martial law, even though it's still not there, mm-hmm. uh, the Thai regime is still very much being controlled by the military personnel, the military court and all that. And here they actually uh, explain more about Article 44. And uh, it seems that all these right groups, like you were just saying, of course, are not happy with what's uh, going on because it gives uh, Prime Minister Prayut Chan Ocha unrestricted powers. And uh, this, uh, I would say, this age, this day, this time, when uh, it's it's not, uh, how to say, it's not very common for us to... Uh, deal with with someone who has unrestricted power. That's something that probably we study about in history hundreds of years ago when the king has absolute power and everything he says is law and you cannot question it. But it seems that it's still happening right now and it's just in Thailand, which is right above us. Well, Thailand is a monarch nation. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the junta leader, uh, he probably is trying to create a law where he can be on par as much as uh, King Bhumipal. It's just that uh, his power will be uh, a defector power. Um, In a in a way, he has unrestricted power not just to disrupt or suppress any action that undermines the national the national security, but also the monarch, the public peace and order, regardless of the legislative, executive, and or judicial force. In a way, his power is beyond mm-hmm. the three separation of powers that uh, mm-hmm. uh, any government's uh, democratic government have. And according to the Thai lawyers for the Human Rights Center, the military court itself falls under the juridis- sorry the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Defense, and this immediately makes it uh, not independent. So it still uh, goes under uh, the ministry. And when it comes to the jurisdiction, the judiciary system, uh, people usually expect them to be independent, so they can uh, be more fair to the people. And the fact that, I, I really don't understand this, mm-hmm. the fact that under Article 44, um, the military junta can actually use military courts to handle civilian case. Can you imagine mm-hmm. if you say something like, you know, maybe something that offended the mm-hmm. monarch and you can be tried in a military court even though you never step into a military base before in your life. That's right, but I think they also stress that it involves a firearm, so anyone who possess any firearm will also definitely <laughs> automatically be tried under the military court, whether or not you're a threat to the country, or it could probably just be a toy gun, I don't know, but it's that uh, risky. And of course, they also said that Thailand is not currently at war in, with any countries, and it's uh, not also really in that much of a state of crisis, and there is no need for them to come up with this very harsh law that anyone would firearm has to be tried in the military court, which is pretty harsh for for a normal citizen in the country. It seems more like an internal, um, I would say, law to Mm -hmm. curb the population inside rather than uh, trying to create this uh, um, defense against national security threats, which I don't think exists at all when it comes to the case with Thailand. So... um, I I I'm really dumbfounded that the fact uh, the law is under the Ministry of Defense mm-hmm. jurisdiction, uh, when you know when it comes to civilian matters, it should be under the juris- judiciary system. Um, 
So in, in this case, it's a big question mark from us. <laughs> yes, and uh, I agree with you that this this law is more of like an internal thing, which uh, goes back to the statement by one of the citizens who said, from the outside, it looks like, you know, they're making all these modifications, mm. this uh, sort of change of impression to give to the outside. But when you're in Thailand itself, inside, it's still the same. You're still being controlled, still being restricted by the government. Talking about war, I'm talking about real war here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to a news about Islamic State. So uh, there's this advice in Indonesia that Islamic State is not worth joining. Uh, this is according to those who have been there and returned back and see the reality what is happening right now in Syria and Iraq. I don't think we've ever had anyone who came back and told us what happened. I'll be curious and be interested to know their view on this because uh, what we are seeing from the outside might not be the mm -hmm. reality. From the inside, it could be even worse. But we have someone here who actually came back from uh, the Islamic State in Indonesia and he his name is Ahmad Junaidi, and he said that his life uh, at the Islamic State movement in Syria was quite monotonous, and it was nothing like what he imagined it would be. So as soon as he reached the, the place yeah. and conducted his duty, he felt like he did little to help anyone, and I, I would have thought so even before stepping in. Uh, this is what he was uh, he said when he was being interviewed by one of the uh, lo uh, local newspaper in Jakarta. And Junaidi, along with Helmi Muhammad Alamuddin and Abdul Hakim Mu Muna Bari, was arrested in Malang, East Jawa after returning from Syria. He's the first Indonesian mm -hmm. willing to share his story, fighting alongside ISIS and ISIL. And I think the, uh, his story is really powerful because young people today, they are easily swayed by really um, high quality mm -hmm. ISIS video about fighting for the sake of Islam and for the creation of an Islamic state. But knowing the reality uh, in the ground, especially the, the, the reality is, act, uh, is more towards a political agenda rather than a religious agenda would perhaps enlighten us more. And uh, you're right about that as well because when he comes back from uh, ISIS, I can imagine everyone going, oh wow, tell us what happened. You know, we want to know. Al although um, they did arrest him. And uh, he would definitely have a lot of influence on uh, the people uh, in Indonesia or pretty much anywhere who are Pro probably still considering on whether or not they want to join ISIS. Should I, should I not? Is this uh, my obligation as a Muslim? And whatever that uh, Junaidi says actually would carry a lot of weight in this context and could change uh, someone's life, uh, anyone who listens to his story. But it seems that he's recommending that ISIS is not really worth joining and he did not have a very smooth experience, although his, all his travel expenses were paid. He still found the trip to Syria very difficult difficult and uh, of course he left his wife and children behind and he had to go uh, all the way to Istanbul, Turkey and then there was an 18 hour bus ride which borders Syria and they had to even cross the barbed wire border on foot so it's mm -hmm. not really uh, as, as easy as, as we uh, were given the impression that yeah. you can just transit a few countries and you're there and everything's just given to you just like that so this is his day to day life uh, him together with 11 other men who were also fellow Indonesians were given two hour shifts a day to guard the city uh, armed only mm -hmm. with, a, with an AK-47 rifle the rest of the day was usually spent reading the Quran along with other with other people mm -hmm. and he said they were deprived of any news and could only call their family once a month from al -Bab. And the men also took turns cooking, cleaning the house where they live. And the house had a cement floor, but no electricity. But had the basic facilities needed, of course, uh, as it, ha it houses all 12 of them. Now I'm calling, I, I, think, <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I think their lives is more like a paid um, labor for military forces. Yeah, it's it more like, like, like a, what a foreign worker would experience yeah, when you go to a their, country. Yeah, it looks like a foreign mm -hmm. labor that is underpaid and under cared. <laughs> and speaking about paid, they were only paid about 42 US dollars per month as opposed to the uh, very lucrative salary that we've been um, 
seeing all over the news that, oh, you're given uh, this much of salary and everything is taken care of. But it seems they are not earning more than $50 a month and they only get to also call back their family once a month. And that doesn't sound very <laughs> lucrative anymore. And the fact that if ISIS is really a state... They already breached one of the uh, international mm. law, which is uh, 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 the horrible labor treatment, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> but, or horrible labor condition. But uh, it doesn't end there. When he wanted to return home, he actually had to finance his own trip. So it seems like it's a one-way ticket. They only pay for you when you want to go there. But if you were to come back, uh, you have to actually finance the whole thing by yourself. And none of your death will be uh, paid off as was promised by the ISIS when they are trying to recruit you. Mm. Uh, but uh, to me... What I see here is government needs to create a public policy where they actually uh, can absorb those who mm -hmm. decided to return back right. and decided that uh, and realize the the truth or the reality on the ground and not just absorb but use this as uh, you know a force for mm -hmm. the government themselves to get as many or to rally as many people on the awareness of ISIS because there's no powerful story than having mm -hmm. someone who has been there, who can tell the story on the ground, who can actually shed the light that this is not a religious struggle at all. It's merely a political struggle for those who have an agenda in Syria and Iraq. And it also goes back to uh, what you were saying about awareness because mm -hmm. all this while, uh, all these countries have been coming up with numerous ways to combat uh, the ISIS in this region. But now that they have someone, they can actually talk to him and figure out why he decided to go there in the first place. And based on uh, what he tells them, uh, I think they could come up with an even better way to curb this problem now that they get their information firsthand mm -hmm. instead of working based on predictions and, and assumptions on why people would join ISIS. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. <coughs> and um, from ISIS where they are struggle to form a state, we have a group of community that is struggle to be part of the citizen mm -hmm. of the state. And I'm talking about the Rohingya here. So the Rohingya's white cards have expired and they will be entering the citizenship verification process. Um, the white card, uh, sorry, hundreds of thousands of temporary identi identity card holders, most of whom are stateless Rohingya Muslims, saw their official identification papers expired uh, to, uh, actually yesterday as a result of a controversial government decision taken in February aimed at revoking their voting rights. So authorities in western Burma's Ar Arakan state, while where many of the Rohingya leaves said hundreds of so-called white cards were voluntarily returned on Wednesday, but local Muslim mm -hmm. leaders said that many would refuse to give up their only remaining form of official identification. I, I totally re agree mm -hmm. with the local Muslim leaders of the Rohingya community. I wouldn't have surrendered my card because... That's the only thing you have. <laughs> that's that the only you identity mm -hmm. you have. I mean, uh, as much as they are already a marginalized committee, for them to actually give up the only thing they have, uh, I mean, they're, they're quite smart as well to uh, mm -hmm. actually uh, refuse uh, and say that, no, I want to uh, be holding on to this thing because uh, I'm already being marginalized, being dis uh, discriminated, being called with names that I don't want to be referred to, and now you want to take away the only thing that gives me an identity in, mm -hmm. in this country. It's really ironic that uh, Muslims are being prosecuted, in, uh, especially, especially Rohingya Muslims are being prosecuted, and none of the Muslim countries are giving a helping hand on this, not even ISIS. So mm -hmm. it's... There's this kind of double standard or a very skewed idea of what Islam ought to be globally. And I think what is happening right now in Myanmar is not really just uh, the concern of human rights, of course, in a bigger picture. But I think if you believe in the idea of sisterhood and brotherhood mm -hmm. among Muslims, they they should put this as their main priority rather than fighting for ISIS or any other political struggles that use the banner of religion. And it's very tricky as well when it comes to religion because uh, more often than not, uh, when uh, 
when we look at uh, a country that is uh, very religious or puts religion at a, at a very high level, we sort of expect them to just behave differently uh, as, as a whole nation, to be more accepting, to be more forgiving, uh, because that's uh, how they're supposed to be if, if you look at it from a religious context. But it seems that... Uh, they are also the ones who are usually uh, oppressing this, this minority group and uh, not giving them the treatment or the respect uh, that they deserve, like you were also saying earlier. What is your priority when it comes to, to the country, as, especially as a citizen of the nation? But it seems that in this case, the government is also giving them sort of like a deadline that they have to actually submit their, what, their cards, whether they like it or not, and they will have a new citizenship verification process, quote unquote, <laughs> by June. By June. And uh, that's like uh, both about our birthdays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it's a positive thing. Uh, I mean, the process itself is not to completely eliminate uh, the Rohingya mm-hmm. community, but to give them a fresh identity as a Rohingya Muslim community. Anyway, that's all from us today. We hope to report more news to you, uh, but you have to listen to us again tomorrow at the same time. And of course, leave any comments you have on our Facebook page, our Twitter page. Just look for Durian ASEAN. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel for all the daily podcasts of news and all our interviews as well. Yeah, that's all from us today.